Right, Pepper. So, today's Mike Body for those session senses. So, in, in this session, we're going to have a look at not every sensor that's out there. Struggle, get it through it all in detail. We're going to have a look at some types of digital sensor, um, some types of positional sensors, and uh, ones that are going to be key to your. Um, to give you a start on your assignment and the selection of um, suitable sensors, cold well, things like that. We're going to have a little bit of a look at an analog and digital conversion. Okay. In terms of the third item, now I think what I'm trying to say there is that we're going to be looking at the sensors in light of <coughs> what we what factors we'd look at when we're trying to select a suitable type. So um, we're going to be looking at what what they're good for sensing, what they aren't good for sensing, and so on. And then lastly, we'll finish up with a little bit about um, dick to eye and AD conversion. <coughs> so, common sensors and the transducers. Any kind of sensor is going to be measuring something, some kind of physical quantity. Light level, temperature, Force, pressure, position, speed, and sound are the ones listed there. I'm sure if I asked you, you could come up with some more. Okay, we're looking at um, measuring light level. We've got uh, light dependent resistors, photodiodes, solar cells, temperature, quite a range there, thermocouples, the misters, the thermostats, RTDs. I'm sure hopefully you've heard of most, if not all, of them. Um, force and pressure. You've got strain gauges, pressure switches, load cells, position, potentiometers, encoders, LVDTs. You know what that stands for, LVDT? We'll be looking at them later. That's linear um, voltage differential transformer. I have to, I have to think about it. Linear. Variable differential transformer. Um, have you never come across LBDT? It's for it sensors linear movement, quite sensitive, good, reliable um, Speed, attacker generator, um, reflective slotted optocoupler. I forgot, no idea what that is. Doppler effect sensors. Um, vaguely, no, maybe a little bit about that off the top of my head. I could say what they do. Sound, carbon microphone, piezo electric crystal, and we could go on and on. We could come up with lots of different sensors. It's a so, the purpose of any sensor. Provide some kind of output dependent upon a physical change in another quantity or the position of a system component. For example, digital sensor on a door alarm will be on or off depending on whether the door is open or closed. A pressure sensor may provide a varying voltage signal with the sensor voltage dependent on the applied pressure. So overall, this type of sensor on, off. This type of sensor analog. will give off an output between limits. We'll touch on it in more detail, I believe, when we look at one or two of them. But people will say that can constantly, analog signals constantly vary. Not necessarily. If, if your quantity, if your temperature is straight line, and the analog signal coming out of the temperature sensor will be straight line. 
what, what they're trying to say is it can be any value between two limits, 0 and 10 volts, 0 and 5 volts. Yeah? It's not a on off signal, it's not a stepped 0, 1 volt, 2 volt, 3 volt, 4 volt signal. It can effectively be any value between that 0 and 10 volts. When we digitise it, which we'll talk about later on, analogue to digital conversion, we want to use computers that control these devices, then we're going to turn it into a step knowledge. We'll talk about the implications of that towards the end of this session. Okay. The sensors are available in a wide range of types to suit a wide range of applications. The main aim of sensor properties or positions is to provide control of a megatronic system. If we don't want to control it, then we don't need to sense it. But if we want to stop that water coming into that tank before it overflows, then we need some kind of sensor to tell us that's getting full. So, digital sensors provide on or off output dependent on a single physical condition should not be confused with a sensor that provides a digitised output of an analogue signal. So there are devices, smart devices out there that effectively got their analogue to digital conversion inside them. Okay. So they're measuring a voltage, they're powered devices, and they give a, a, a digitised analogue output input to a PLC or whatever the other device you want to do to it. Some typical digital on-off sensors are limit or micro switches, inductive proximity switches, capacitive proximity switches, magnetic proximity switches, photoelectric proximity switches. And we could make quite a bit bigger list than that if we really wanted to on the That one covers those bases. So, limit or micro switches, wide range of styles, sizes are available, their main advantage has been they are simple, relatively robust as a unit, and they provide a positive physical contact with the device that, or the, the item that's moving into position or the door that's open. They don't require a um, an external power supply to operate at all. So they are clean contact devices in that sense. Um, main disadvantages is that they have a mechanical life. Eventually, contacts will wear out. Mechanically, they can, they'll wear and break. So the mechanical mechanism. Electrical contacts have a finite life. Subject to ingress of dirt and moisture. If you'd ever worked at the place like I used to work, Bernard Matthews, the water there would get in anywhere. No matter how much plastic you put around the cabinet, seals, how many, how much you um, put sealant on the gaskets, water will get in. So that can be a disadvantage. They can be broken by physical contact due to poor adjustment. So if somebody doesn't adjust them too high and you've got something moving into their zone and they get broken because of too much force being applied to the wheel or actuator um, and they can be difficult to make an accurate adjustment. So if you want real fine stop in a certain position, then a mechanical um, contact limit switch is probably not the best because of doesn't have that consistent an operation. But to confirm that something's in a certain position on a regular basis, it's a good option. So that's um, mechanical limit switches. I assume you've probably all experienced them in some kind of way. Right, secondly, Inductive proximity switches used for non-contact detection of metallic objects. So the operating principle here is that there's a coil and an oscillator 
creating a magnetic field around a sensor head. Presence of a metallic object within that within that the area of that field has effect of dampening the field. And so what they do is they include an electronic circuit that senses that the change and trips a transistor circuit to switch the output over <coughs> from one state to another, either on or off. So the advantages of that are that the sensor is non-contact, so it doesn't make any kind of physical contact with the moving part that you're trying to sense. Um, so you won't damage or disturb any kind of product if it's the product you're trying to sense. You won't move it or, da or, or damage it in any way. Um, some types can have um, an adjustable sensing distance and they can discriminate between metallic and non-metallic objects. So you can uh, uh, use it as a simplistic sort of thing uh, if you've got um, metallic and, and, and plastic um, objects coming through, you could use that as a simple glass sort. Disadvantages is that the sense and distance is relatively small and that some types require an extra power supply to power the electronics. So, you know, you, there are types that, that go direct in, like you just put in, like it was a normal switch, and it'll take its power from the, the control circuit, but most of them are like four wire or three wire switches that require a power supply plus a switch wire. Capacity of the proximity switches. These will, these are similar in operation, but they're used for non-contact protection of both metallic and non-metallic objects. So the principle here is that they use a variation in capacity between sensor and object between sensed. When the object enters the preset distance from the sensor, an electronic circuit begins to oscillate. When the oscillation reaches a certain level, the electronic circuits switch the sensor angle. So as something approaches it, the capacitance level changes between that object and the sensor, and then there's a certain level that trips the internal circuitry and switches the angle, either on or off. Again, it's got similar advantages of non-contact, um, adjustable sense and distance can be used in conjunction with inductive types to discriminate between um, metallic and non-metallic objects. If you think you, if you just had the inductive type, that'll sense your metal, but it won't even know the plastic is there. So if if you have if you have a combination of the two, the capacitive one will sense the metal object. And the, and the inductive will confirm as metal, but if you only got a plastic object, the inductive one won't come on, and the capacitive one will, must be plastic. Yep. So you, you, you can use them in combinate, combination. Disadvantages are um, similar, but sensitive, sensitive is relevant to the small and um, requires separate power supply. The other thing with those types is getting in a muddle between sinking and source type sensors. Have you ever got in a muddle with that type of thing? Because you've got really four combinations. Because you've got normally you've got sinking and sourcing, normally open, normally closed, and you can get in a right muddle of getting the right combination out of those four options. Sometimes when you're changing a sensor. However, some manufacturers make them so they can be wired either way, depending on how you, how you connect them up. So that, that can be a little bit of a minefield that when you're trying to find the right sensor to replace one that you've already got. Particularly if you're looking, I've, I've found it particularly awkward, if you're looking for a replacement for a sensor that's obsolete, and you can't get any more and you're trying to find the right option to replace to replace it. Um, magnetic proximity switches 
Um, electrical contacts actuated by the presence of a permanent magnet cliff to the switch. They're like thin reed like plates. So there's a little reed switch on the side of the cylinder. It's the type of thing we're talking about here. Um, contact uh, hermetically sealed in a glass bowl with the gas. So there's no physical contact between the item and the sensor. Steel contacts have a higher life expectancy. They have a small size and they don't have the ingress of dust and moisture that you get with the bigger mechanical um, limit switches. However, the contacts do have a finite mechanical life. It's better than micro switches. Um, requires switch and magnet and, and magnet mount. So if you want to use them on cylinders, you have to buy cylinders with a magnetic um, element in the, in the piston to so they operate. Um, but they're, they're fairly fairly reliable little, the little switches for the pneumatic cylinders, that's for sure. Photoelectric proximity switches. Four types. See next slide. So we'll look at that in a minute. All operate by the use of light sensitive elements that are made up of an emitter, light source, and a receiver. An object between the light source and receiver causes electronic circuit to switch, put on, and off. Main advantages the very wide range of types. Sensor over a long distance, and they are non-contact. Main disadvantages, very wide range of types make it difficult to choose. So what is an advantage, also a disadvantage? How do we choose the right one? Can be tricky to align and adjust. Can be affected by moisture or dust. Again, these electronic eye scenarios in a food factory with water flying about everywhere. Big pain. That might be better these days because they might have come up with solutions to the problem. But certainly you used to have a lot of trouble with them. In the, factories. the four types are, or three main types. So there's there, there's four of them. Direct reflective, diffused. We have an emitter and a receiver. In one housing, <laughs> sends out a beam in one direction, looks for a beam coming back <laughs> off the object being sensed. Second type, reflection with reflector or retro reflective. Again, in one housing, ultra reflector back. And an object going between them would break that beam and set the sensor off. Yeah. So it's, it's the, this one is reflecting when there's an object in front of it. This one is reflecting when there isn't an object in front of it. <laughs> then when we put an object in front of it, that reflection stops. Polarised reflection with reflector, similar to this one here, but has the advantage that being more reliable sensing shiny objects, less likely to be affected by random reflections. So they polarise the light. Through beam is where the emitter and the um, transmitter are separated so there's a beam just going in one direction and then we when an object comes in from the top we break that beam are you familiar with photoelectric sensors at all Oh, it's like a, a, a curtain, like a light curtain, yeah. 
Yeah, that they're probably a little bit more technical than, than these. Um, there, because the beam would go on crisscross. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're they're a bit more. That they're all long, no long the same type of technology, but for safety purposes, they're a little bit more robust than what we're talking about. But I've seen these these two types used in certainly on distances from here to the wall a bit reliable. Yeah. <coughs> Tend to be a little bit more reliable. This one, will, this one will do a reasonable distance as well. That one's really the things that are that, that are quite close, in which case to the top one. But three or four hundred mil away, I think. Set my height. Also, these days you've got sensors that will detect different colours, shiny objects, and all sorts of things. There's a huge, huge range of 